<coughs> I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Noah Dresner to you as our second keynote speaker today. I know it's been a very long <coughs> and rich day already, but it's pretty worthwhile to, to stay on with us for the coming hour, <coughs> and that will conclude our day. So Noah is Associate Professor of Higher Education, and he's Program Director for Higher <coughs> and Post-Secondary Education at Teachers College, Columbia University, New York. He's also a visiting professor of education and philanthropic studies at Beijing Normal University in China. He's internationally known as a leading researcher on educational philanthropy, so he's really quite something. <laughs> and his research in interests include philanthropy and fundraising for higher education in particular. And he has published six books numerous articles, and is the founding editor of the Philanthropy and Education Journal. Thank you, Noah, for being here. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to say that uh, just as I was sitting in the last uh, session, not because of the conversation, but because of my jet lag kicking in, I apologize if I'm a little bit... Uh, slow, but uh, these waking up in the middle of the night and then expecting to do a full day is uh, having its impact on me. Uh, but as I see yawning going on in the front, thank you. Thank you for supporting my tiredness. Um, good. Laughter is good at this time, so please laugh throughout the conversation. Even if you're laughing at me, it's totally fine, but laughter is good. So first I want to say, uh, for those who are uh, from the U.S., either as uh, citizens or who have spent time there, expats, etc., uh, happy Thanksgiving. Um, it is today, so, and thank you, Norag, for having uh, the conversation on uh, Thanksgiving Day. This Thanksgiving is... Th it's my pleasure. I didn't have to cook for 20 people today, so that's, that is my pleasure, actually. Um, so... This Thanksgiving actually begins a interesting uh, month in in U.S. in the U.S. around individual giving, right? So today is Thanksgiving. We say what we're thankful for. So I'm thankful for, uh, for being here, etc. And that's followed by then two days of gluttony and personal uh, purchasing. We have uh, Black Friday tomorrow, which I hear that has been incorporated around the world. U.S. exceptionalism going everywhere. Gluttony. Um, and then on Monday, actually, is Cyber Monday, in which uh, there's actually been documented a decrease in productivity in uh, work uh, because everyone is shopping when they go to work uh, because there's additional online deals that kick in on Monday. And then following that, on Tuesday, uh, about five years ago, we've created Giving Tuesday, where a number of nonprofits uh, go out and seek uh, donations to kick off the uh, giving season as we get towards uh, the different holidays and also towards um, the end of the tax year where people can uh, get their last minute tax benefit by, uh, in the U.S. by uh, giving uh, their gifts. So this is the beginning of a uh, season of philanthropy in the U.S. and I think it's actually quite nice, joking aside that it's on Thanksgiving Day that uh, we're convening at this time. Um, My talk today is going to focus on individual giving towards higher education, so it's a little bit different from what we have been hearing for the past uh, day and a half. And given my own work uh, has primarily been within the U.S. context, I'm heavily going to draw on the U.S. context um, and my work of mapping individual giving towards U.S. higher education, both from a historical perspective and a contemporary uh, perspective, to make my argument. Uh, this is just an overview of the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to uh, show this global growth in uh, the seeking of individual giving towards higher education philanthropy, uh, give a little bit of the history of higher education uh, philanthropy in the United States, followed by a little bit of what the contemporary impact is of individual giving, and then try to engage us uh, briefly in uh, three possible expl explanations uh, for uh, this uh, growth of institutional search for uh, philanthropic dollars, particularly uh, from individuals, which will then lead into some larger questions and concerns about this uh, global movement that, uh, that we could be thinking about. 
So first, the global growth. Uh, here is a quick map of the world, which you all know. Uh, formal, formal concerted uh, giving towards higher education uh, began in the, in the United States. We're going to go into much more detail, but the uh, founding of Harvard uh, College was in 1636, and their first, uh, uh, their first uh, donation was made in 1638. So that's when higher education fundraising began uh, with a fundraising brochure that's actually called New England's First Fruits, and it's actually, you can find it in the archives, and you can read uh, how uh, solicitations looked off early. But now uh, it's gone much further, and this is where uh, currently, there are 61 countries that have individual colleges and universities as members of the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education case, which is a U.S.-based association for practitioners of educational fundraising. Um, while they do focus on all types of fundraising in terms of corporate and foundation giving, their main focus is, uh, in terms of practitioners, is for individual giving. And these 61 uh, countries do not account for uh, countries or institutions that are engaging in fundraising but are not members of CASE. So this is just the impact that CASE has had uh, on this global growth. So that's going to set up our conversation for today. But before we explore why this expansion might be taking place, uh, I want to uh, use the U.S. as a case, as I mentioned before. So philanthropy has played an instrumental role in the development of colleges and universities in the United States going back to, as I said, in 1638 with the gift of John, uh, of John Harvard to aid what at the time was a fledgling colonial college on the banks of the Charles River in uh, Massachusetts. But it wasn't just uh, this one large gift that is interesting about the early part of philanthropy towards higher education. Here are some early examples of philanthropy uh, including candles and blankets that went to colonial colleges and gifts of farm animals. Uh, and what's interesting about this, this was actually just providing the warmth of a blanket, candles to read by, and literally food to eat for our uh, students and our faculty. And most of the contributions to colonial colleges were given without restriction, as, uh, and the institutions could decide how they were being used. And really, rather than investing in endowments and long-term future, the colleges were donations were being used to erect buildings, buy books, uh, provide scholarships, and, and pay for salaries, et cetera. And what I think is significant about this is that this is really showing that this was a community effort early on, <laughs> that we weren't talking about large gifts. We were talking about the community valuing education, an education that was very exclusive, yet um, the community was thinking about how they could support it. Um, even though uh, these are very modest gifts, uh, major gifts from wealthy individuals still were uh, being shepherded early on in uh, higher education. So this is uh, Jeremiah Drummer, um, and the set setting of Yale provides a good example for early philanthropy. Uh, during the shaky founding years of the Collegiate College of New Haven, uh, Jeremiah Drummer was an important force in the solidification of the college's future. And while he was a colonial agent, he really uh, saw himself also as a bit of a development officer going out and fundraising uh, for, the, for the school. And he wrote uh, in one of his letters to uh, Elihu Yale, who is the namesake of the university prior to uh, receiving that naming gift, that, quote, that the business of good men is to spread religion and learning among mankind. And that was to pardon the gendered nature of it, but it was, you know, in 1718. So, um, but this was a conversation of why people were starting to give. Who was, what was the purpose of higher education? How you could be uh, brought into uh, the fold of this? Does anyone by any chance know um, in 1718 what Jeremiah Drummer uh, was able to secure from Elihu Yale as naming rights for Yale University, now Yale University? Any ideas? So, it was the proceeds of nine bales of hay, 417 books, and a portrait of King George I. <laughs> now, of course, many more have given much more to uh, Yale since then, but he was at the right place at the right time to have his name on the university. Um, but you can see that, again, it was even, this was giving of a library and, you know, some bales of hay. 
Um, and you could see that in 1718, we thought that we were going to still be friends of King George for a while uh, to make that worthwhile to take. Beyond uh, looking at these beginning of, the, of it, and don't worry, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, looking at institutions, but I can't uh, not look at how philanthropy has uh, driven new education and innovations without looking at my own uh, home institution right now, uh, Teachers College at Columbia University, uh, which was founded in 1887 by philanthropist Grace Hudley, Hudley Dodge and a philosopher, Nicholas Murray Butler. Uh, to provide a new kind of schooling for teachers of the poor children of New York, one which combined a humanitarian concern to help others with a scientific approach to human development. And the founders, uh, Dodge and uh, Butler, early recognized that professional teachers needed a, reli uh, needed a reliable knowledge about the conditions under which college, uh, children learn most effectively. And as a result, the college's early programs uh, had fundamental uh, subjects of educational psychology and educational sociology, uh, which until then was not really part of the teacher education program. So you can see that philanthropy, even in uh, the late 19th century, uh, was being influenced by donors and their thoughts about, uh, rather philanthropy was, uh, was influencing uh, with their dollars the way that education was, ha was happening. In this case, we might argue that it's a good thing, but we can be, uh, as we have been throughout uh, the past day and a half, we could be critical of that as well. As a final example, we've also seen how philanthropy has been behind the transformation of higher education from liberal arts to research universities. And here's an example. This is um, uh, the University of Chicago, and it was uh, really transferred from a small Baptist college into a world-class uh, research university at the turn of the century in 1900 by an $80 million gift uh, by the Rockefeller family, not actually the foundation, but the family itself. And that's the power of a transformation with such large gifts. So a little bit about the impact on US higher education that philanthropy has had besides the examples that I just gave is American higher education fundraising, as I mentioned, are nearly synonymous uh, with the need for external funding for American higher education existing really since its inception until today. But it's really evolved over the, over the past four centuries in terms of thinking about who is actually doing the fundraising and how it's taking place with different fundraising roles, including early on clergy and presidents and financial agents or trustees doing with the primary uh, fundraising to then senior faculty and treasurer, treasurers and alumni secretaries to now much more professionalized uh, fundraising uh, initiative. Uh, fundraising at colleges and universities have become much more organized in the last in the 20th century, with the launch of the first organized capital campaigns. Um, and after World War I, uh, professional fundraising consultants began to advise, and in some cases, the consultants were running uh, the entire campus uh, fundraising projects from the outside of uh, the campus. And in the 1920s, we start seeing campus-based fundraisers uh, taking responsibility um, and the first uh, fundraising really emerging um, uh, on an expansive level. But it was in the 1930s that we first saw a vice president for um, fundraising arrive on a handful of private institutions' campuses. Um, at the conclusion of World War II, campuses uh, were expanding in the United States, mostly because of the GI Bill, which was a uh, legislative bill that guaranteed a free higher education to uh, returning veterans. And because of the number of students that were coming, more and more colleges began to employ uh, fundraising staffs in order to build uh, additional residence halls and different uh, additional classroom space and things like that to uh, usher in this new massification of higher education. And thus calls for the professionalization of higher education fundraising really began. And in 1958, over 70 uh, presidents, trustees, fundraisers, and representatives from professional fundraising and, pub um, and public relations organizations held a me meeting in the Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia, which is also famously known as uh, for being the place that in, in nuclear attack uh, Congress goes to uh, continued legislating. 
which is kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, the conference was funded by the Ford Foundation and was co-sponsored by the American Alumni Council and the uh, American Council for Public Relations. And it resulted in, a gr in what's called the Greenbrier Report, which is actually quite interesting because they asked uh, for the creation of vice presidents for fundraising that had equal status to chief administ uh, academic administrators on the campus uh, that were going to oversee public relations, fundraising, and alumni affairs. And that's pretty uh, significant within a higher education concept to say that a fundraiser should be this equivalent of a dean or a provost um, in an administrative uh, cabinet. Uh, so I think that that really shows uh, where uh, the impact of philanthropy was going. In 1974, these two uh, organizations that I mentioned, the American Council for uh, the American Alumni Council and the American Council for Public Rela uh, Relations, combined and joined forces and created CASE, the Council for the Advancement of Support of Education that I mentioned earlier. And around at the same time, although not related to the creation of CASE, we uh, see uh, public and higher education beginning to uh, get involved in fundraising as well. Uh, primarily before that, it was just a, in the uh, private space uh, in the United States. So where does that really bring us uh, today? And that brings us to multi-billion dollar uh, campaigns. Uh, Stanford University was the first uh, to announce a billion dollar campaign. It was actually $1.1 billion in 1987. And since uh, 1987, we've had over 85, I think it's close to 90 multi-billion dollar campaign, billion and multi-billion dollar campaigns have already been completed and currently somewhere is around 45 to 50 are currently uh, existing right now. So it's been quite a few uh, with a few institutions already in their second or third uh, multi-billion dollar campaign at this point. Um, Hopkins, NYU, University of Michigan, University of Virginia, just to get, name a, through, a few. And the largest campaigns that have been going on um, had been uh, $6.5 billion that was just uh, uh, completed by Harvard University, $6 billion at uh, USC, and in uh, public uh, institutions, the largest was $4.2 billion by UCLA. And you might be asking why 4.2? And that's because the University of Michigan, it, one of its rivals, uh, just the year before announced a $4 billion campaign. So why only do $4 billion when you can take someone out by raising a little fraction more than that? So there is some competition there. So you might be asking, especially amongst many of you who look at foundations, why do I focus on individuals? And here's just one reason of it. Uh, individuals account for about 42.5% of higher education's voluntary support uh, in the United States. And it's actually more when you account for giving from family foundations, which is in that uh, red part over there. Um, 30 percent there. Uh, some of that is family foundations in which uh, it's still, um, you could still see it as individual uh, support. What does this uh, impact begin to look like? Uh, here you see that individual support for higher education has steadily been on the rise since 1974. Here you can see that, uh, you can see that in the trend line in blue. I adjusted this all to uh, 24, uh, 2014 uh, figures uh, in order to correct for inflation. Um, and higher education in uh, 2014 received $37.5 billion uh, in philanthropic gifts uh, from individuals, um, finally surpassing the giving level uh, that was set, uh, the decline rather, that uh, happened uh, in uh, the Great Recession in 2008-2009. Uh, and it's continued to rise since uh, uh, 2014. You can see here the gray bars represent uh, recessions in the United States, and you can see slowdowns or even declines uh, in giving uh, in those time periods, and you'll be able to see that uh, even more apparent when we uh, look at uh, the next slide uh, that looks at percentage change over the year. Uh, the red and green lines indicate the percentage of individual giving as part of the total uh, voluntary giving, and you can see that alumni and non-alumni at the beginning were fairly equal in terms of their percentage, and then around 1986 we see non-alumni uh, giving drop as a percentage and alumni giving uh, increase. Uh, the run-up to 1986 uh, also marked a greater increase in giving where, uh, with a no noticeable decline in, uh, in 1987. 
can't figure that out, but that's okay, um, because I'll show it there. Um, and this is because of the Tax Reform Act of 19, uh, 1986, which increased the after-tax costs of giving uh, significantly, um, which also uh, uh, brings some interesting questions for uh, the conversations that are going on today with the U.S. administration and the Trump tax cuts, uh, what the uh, implications might be of those tax cuts on higher education uh, fundraising. Uh, you'll see here that... Um, the literature at the time thought that this was going to be something that we were not going to be able to um, overcome, that giving was going to decline and not come back. You do see here that uh, it does come back uh, fairly quickly, um, but there was some lead time for especially the wealthiest donors um, in 1986 to uh, play off, pay off their uh, prior pledges or to make large gifts uh, when the uh, value of their uh, tax deduction was going to be higher before December 31st, uh, 1986. So they pre-gave, and that was what caused the, uh, the decline in 1987. As I mentioned before, um, here is where you can see the impact of uh, the recessions a little bit more clearly when looking at uh, the losses of giving or the negative percentage that occurred uh, within recessions. Um, there's one notable uh, exception, and that's right after uh, the Tax Reform Act. You see that negative drop that I mentioned before. Um, also, you see another one in uh, 1987, which was uh, due to um, Black Monday, uh, which is the largest uh, one-day percentage decline in uh, the stock market in U.S. history, where the stock market dropped almost a quarter, 22.6% uh, in one day. Uh, which, uh, even though the stock market began to recover and it was seen as a uh, correction, uh, there was a sense of psychic poverty, this concept of psychic poverty among stoners in which they were worried that uh, even though they did have liquidity and they were able to uh, give, they didn't want to uh, give just in case there was going to be another um, correction. You'll also see in 1982 that there seems to be a decline in an increase. There was a brief financial recovery there. Um, in which we went back into a recession. Um, but how does this all impact the actual dollars that goes into the budget? And I think that this is where it's uh, most interesting. So according to the Council for Aid, uh, Aid to Education, unrestricted uh, annual programs make up more than 10% of current operations at U.S. colleges and universities. However, uh, when combined with restricted gifts, so interest from endowments or spending from endowments, are as a result of prior philanthropy, the percentage of annual budgets stemming, uh, stemming from giving increases dramatically. Private and public colleges in the U.S. would not be able to reach their fiscal obligations or curricular goals without this voluntary support that donors are providing uh, to supplement tuition and other sources of income. But to give this a, a little bit of a, of, a, uh, of a clear message in terms of what this means for day-to-day -day spending at colleges and universities, as you can see here, both in money spent from the endowment, uh, which is uh, the blue line, and uh, money resulting in, uh, from current use gifts um, over the past 25 years, they have both been increasing and they've both been um, uh, uh, quite even. Uh, with each other. Um, you can see that um, endowment spending um, is much more uh, tied to uh, recessions in the stock market, and that's because of the investment strategies that the institutions are using, but also because of uh, the individual giving is tied to um, the stock market as well. But with, when you combine these two uh, lines together, this, you get this green line, and it shows that um, in 2012, $40 billion in U.S. higher education budgets came from spending in one year. So I told you earlier that uh, the giving was about $40 uh, billion by individuals, but some of that goes to endowment. So you have to take that endowment out, and then you spend about half of that goes to endowment uh, each year. And then when you take the current use gifts, the annual funds, et cetera, plus the spending off the endowment, you uh, nicely come to that still $40 billion amount, which is quite significant if you think about it in terms of our larger budgets. 
So now that we've explored the U.S. context a bit, I want us to think a little bit about the possible explanations uh, for the growth of fundraising and philanthropy in the U.S., and perhaps more interestingly, uh, globally, for this conversation today. And I'm going to posit uh, three different explanations, a functional uh, explanation, an isomorphic explanation, and a borrowing and lending explanation. Uh, thank you, Gita, uh, for all of your work on that. Um, I think it's important to note that none of these explanations in my mind are pure and that they are complex with aspects overlapping um, and also interactions with politics, policies, and other phenomena complicating our view of what these explanations can be. So first, the functional argument, and using uh, the US again as a case, I'm going to show uh, how budget relief is really po a possible driving force, and I think that that's probably the easiest argument that uh, we can make. So in the US, there's been a shift of the bur burden who is responsible for higher education, even at public institutions, and the shift is part of a larger move that uh, we're questioning in the United States about moving from um, seeing higher education really as a private good rather than a public good as it was once seen. And to reduce that burden on students, institutions have been moving to private philanthropy uh, to fill that gap. Net tuition revenue ha um, has mostly uh, rapidly, uh, sorry, net tuition re revenue has grown most rapidly as a percentage of the total educational revenue in uh, public institutions during uh, periods that the state support has declined, in other words, in, during economic downturns. But you would, you would think that if it was only an economic downturn that was uh, reducing state support, when you got out of this shaded area, we would see a downtick, right? You would understand that uh, we are going back to the state's responsibility. In the United States, we're actually seeing the exact opposite, that when you are uh, going into recession, states might need to reduce uh, their spending on higher education, but they're also using this as an excuse to get out of the higher education spending in general. Even when uh, the budgets come back, the tax revenues are higher in the state, their investment in higher education does not uh, come back. And here you can see that uh, more easily. This is the 50 states in the United States. I know it's a little bit small, but this shows uh, the decrease in state funding after the 2008 Great Recession and shows that even uh, in 2014, we were fully rebounded from it. We're still seeing some states down between 20 and 50% in terms of what they were spending uh, per student in inflation uh, dollars. So this is really showing that the money is not coming back. You might be interested in these bottom two states that have increased uh, their time there. If you can't read them, they are Alaska and North Dakota. And those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, uh, US politics, you would not think that they're the most progressive uh, states in terms of educational fundraising, uh, or educational funding, rather but they are oil-rich states. So these are states in which there are actually uh, no or very, very low tax, and they build uh, everything off of the oil endowment that the state has by, um, by lending out and leasing out uh, the state land in which that are oil-rich. So while this is a functional, uh, with, while my functional need for philanthropy and showing to take away this burden for students was really shown uh, you, using U.S. higher education as, a, as an example, I think that it's very true for many different countries that we can see uh, that there is a reduction in state support for higher education. Um, but um, this is not... Uh, the uh, only answer. I think that this is only a very simplistic answer of looking at, at it in terms of we're fundraising because there's a need. So the next argument that I want to bring is the isomorphic argument, uh, which I think is a little bit more complex of a conversation. So DiMaggio and Powell uh, explain isomorphism as a innovation that spreads, uh, as an innovation spreads, a threshold is reached beyond which adaptation provides legi legitimacy rather than improves performance. And I think that this actually might account for uh, some of the global movement of philanthropy from individuals. The isomorphic princi uh, principles of seeking prestige and legitimacy over needs and performance can be seen uh, through the lens of rankings, both in the US and worldwide. In the US, there's both explicit and implicit ways in which philanthropy is, are used 
philanthropy is used in rankings as a means to measure prestige and legitimacy. So for example, in the US News and World Report methodology, which is uh, the th most uh, go-to uh, ranking system in the United States, and what's interesting about that, print media is not doing very well in the United States and around the world. US News and World Report only needs to sell that one issue, the college ranking issue, to be in black for the whole year. Right? So this is the power of rankings, is they sell one magazine and then they could not sell any magazines for the rest of the year, and they're profitable. Right? But in US News and World Report, we're going to actually measure philanthropy as part of prestige. So 5% of the measure is very um, explicit, and that is alumni giving as a percentage of, of participation. And this is meant, they say, to mark satisfaction. Right, satisfaction means that if you are going to, um, if you feel like you're going to give to your alma mater, it must mean that you were satisfied with your education. Well, we know that this is not all the, the only reason why people give. People give because they think it's going to add to their value of degree because U.S. News World and World Report is ranking them. People give for many other uh, complex reasons uh, than satisfaction, including wanting to change the institution, etc. Further. Um, not everyone who is satisfied with their college experience necessarily has the disposable income to give. So it's not the best measure of satisfaction. And then there's implicit ways uh, that uh, philanthropy is measured um, in the US News and World Report. An additional 10% is on financial resources. Financial resources there uh, includes endowment by full-time equivalent uh, student, as well as a measure which is quite high, almost a quarter of your score is based on reputation, and reputation uh, by ac other academic leaders can be impacted by alumni giving, campaigns, success, publicity, and the like, that are all infiltrating into people's understanding of reputation of an institution. Therefore, there is some level of prestige that, or, that is going to be associated with philanthropy. Globally, it's not as clear, but I still think it, it's part of it. We don't see at this point um, any explicit measure of philanthropy in the global rankings. Um, however, we do see that the implicit use of academic reputation uh, amounts to about a third of the methodology in, uh, in the times of uh, higher education uh, conversation. So in many ways, philanthropy is now an integral part of rankings. Um, in other words, it's, taking, it's taken for granted, granted that the ability to raise and attract philanthropy is an indicator of quality or prestige. And through the, uh, through the engagement with rankings, striving institutions will act on alumni giving and other forms of philanthropy in order to uh, continue to strive up, um, up the rankings charts. We can also further. Uh, we can also see that it's continually noted that the most elite institutions are also the same ones that are most successful at fundraising. So here, 75% of the 500 billion dollars in endowment wealth in higher U.S. higher education is held by only 11% of the colleges. Um, this is actually part of the argument that uh, Congress right now is uh, looking at the, uh, in, if you're following the U.S. tax conversation, about taxing um, higher education endowments. Uh, they're looking at where the wealth is being held. Um, further, also about a quarter of the $41 billion raised uh, last year went to only 20 institutions. So, and these are the 20 most elite institutions that you can think of. If you were to think of, look at the US News and World Report rankings and then put the uh, fundraising uh, best hits list, uh, they would be identical, uh, just a couple of differences in terms of where the ranking would be, but it would be uh, the same 20 institutions. We're seeing the same thing in uh, the UK where 78% of philanthropic gifts were secured by 18 elite institutions. Where I think it's, uh, we can begin to see isomorphism also in uh, Asia. And uh, so although uh, universities in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China are well-funded by their governments, university research departments are uh, compared internationally by global rankings, as we've been talking about. So the endowment and the money that's being raised by 
uh, for research uh, sponsorships and scholarships are becoming more and more important. And we can see that this is not a functional argument because we're seeing that governments such as Singapore, uh, but all, th all three of them, are actually engaging in government matching of philanthropic gifts. And Singapore is, has the highest, rank, uh, highest matching gift of 1.5 uh, times the dollar that is raised. So if it was a functional argument that the Singapore uh, government uh, wasn't able to fund higher education, there wouldn't be any room for a match. This is really to bring in the dollars. And you can see this here uh, from a quote that the uh, Hong Kong Secretary General for Higher Education said that poor, uh, people don't give to poor universities, they give to excellent universities. So you can again see this conversation about prestige or striving uh, get into um, our uh, understanding of why some of these institutions that might not need to be in philanthropy are going to be in uh, the uh, philanthropy space. So finally, to our uh, last argument today of the borrowing and lending of uh, best practices. <clears throat> so I think that this is, uh, can be seen through the prolifer proliferation of case uh, that I mentioned earlier, if you remember that map of how we moved from one uh, country, the United States, in terms of case membership to 61 countries. And what does that actually mean for institutions outside of the United States and Canada? So uh, all, in, any institution, um, numbers outside of the U.S. and Canada, rather, is 503 individual institutions are members of case. Uh, we also uh, have the joking side of, of, of CASE is many practitioners, while it's called Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, they've reappropriated the acronym and they call it Copy and Steal Everything. <laughs> so practitioners are not uh, being shy about this borrowing and lending that's going on, or in their words, uh, stealing <laughs> that might be going on. And you can also see uh, the investment of the Carnegie Corporation in terms of creating investments for infrastructure um, around the world um, as well. I'm going to move quickly because I want to make sure that we have some questions and that everyone can still get to uh, enjoy the evening in Geneva. So there's some larger questions that I think uh, we need to think about. Uh, first, my work has shown that uh, there are different cultures of philanthropy working within the United States, let alone when you move out globally. Um, and what works in the United States or even in the UK will not work uh, everywhere. And further, there are different sociologics or understandings of the purpose of higher education in different national contexts. That might impact how individuals understand the need or feel the responsibility to give towards education of other citizens. So this all leads me to ask questions like, why does fundraising for higher education mean, what does fundraising for higher education mean within a neoliberal context versus a welfare state context? Um, further, um, I think that there's just a need for more uh, research about individual giving that is outside of the U.S. context. Again, looking at this uh, question of how, how does it impact differently when you're in an individualist society like the U.S. versus a collectivist society in China, um, and also really questioning what models that we're using in terms of this. So I mentioned that CASE is the big uh, organization that's going out, and there's 503 institutions in 61 countries that are and the Carnegie Corporation is sharing all of this information, but is the US model the right model that should be used around the world? I don't think so. We've been doing this for 400 years, fundraising in the United States. Most institutions and most parts of the, of the world have been only wrestling with this for a couple of years in the grand scheme of things. Our understanding of a culture of giving, our understanding of what the government's role in education is and the way that we think about um, our, our society is different than most countries, so it can't uh, necessarily be the same. So I'm just going to uh, wrap up with a point of privilege of being uh, one of these speakers uh, in terms of talking about uh, a new journal that just came out last week with its first issue, uh, Philanthropy and Education. It's sponsored uh, by Teachers College and is published by Indiana University Press, where the Lilly School of Philanthropy Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is, as well as um, uh, one of the largest uh, sets of philanthropic studies books, uh, book catalog, et cetera. And I really want to encourage uh, many of you in this room to consider making a submission to the journal. Uh, we're looking for philanthropy broadly defined and education broadly defined. What? 
Are, did I say financial? No. <laughs> did I say financial? No. Oh, you're throwing me off, Gita. Okay. Yes, article submissions. It's, it's a funded journal already, so I don't, I don't need the money, although if you want to fund my research, that's a different story. We can talk later. Um, but no, we would love article submissions. We're looking for both uh, philanthropy broadly defined and education broadly defined, domestic to the U.S., but also internationally conversations. And we really want to bring scholar practitioners into the conversation as well. Um, just looking at higher education, I mentioned this to a couple people earlier in the uh, uh, conference. In the past 10 years, there's been 250 dissertations looking at fundraising in higher education that were written, and less than 10% of those ever made it into academic journals. And this really actually ends up stunting uh, what we can do as a field because we're asking the same questions over and we're not building theory, we're not uh, engaging practice. So we want to make sure that scholar practitioners, whether they are recent graduates or have been in the field for a long time, have an avenue to share this. And in order to do that, we've set up a mentoring program. You still go through the same uh, peer review process that everyone else does, but we try to demystify the peer review process and help you figure out how to say no to reviewers when that's necessary and how to make it into a process that is actually uh, doable on the other end. So please uh, find me to get more information. I have flyers, etc. cetera, uh, and we really welcome to continue the conversation that's only starting today uh, to be both in edited volumes but also uh, in these journal pages as well. So with that, I think we have time for questions, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noah, for your Thanksgiving speech. So as a, as a gift, we'll take a few questions. Uh, we've been live streaming this also, so that is a, if there's any relevant online questions, Arushi, you will let me know. Let's take two or three questions, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, I, I still grapple with this, this idea that um, most of the money is going to only a limited lucky group of um, foundations. Same thing happening in, in Africa with perhaps 40 universities getting all, all of the cake. But, but uh, isn't it a contradiction when you think that foundations seek impact or the great, greatest impact but when that, all that money is actually going to, um, to institutions that don't really need it, where is that impact and, and what can be done to change that? Um, I'm assuming that if we give a billion dollars to uh, the poorest institutions, there'll be far more impact than giving it to Harvard. Do you want to take the question one after the other? Or shall we take two or three if there's additional questions? Let's. Please. Yeah, yeah, the contradiction. No, in the in the data, is there any distinction made between alumni or yeah, alumni giving for academic versus sports? Or yeah. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Quickly, and then go. Is this on? Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. So actually, one with, this is a question that I get on a regular basis, so I, uh, looked, I actually got it from a reviewer on a uh, piece that hopefully is going to be accepted soon. Uh, so I was just engaging in that data on the plane over here. And only about 8% of alumni giving in terms of current use giving, annual fund giving, is going to athletics uh, last year. So the vast majority is going to other academic purposes. Now, the question then might be in terms of uh, where is it going? Is it going towards scholarships or is it going to capital spaces? Is it going to uh, faculty research or faculty investment, student activities and things like that? I haven't memorized those numbers, uh, but I was specifically asked about the athletic one, so that's why I remember that one. Um, but it's a, small, it's a much smaller percentage than what we think. Should I answer yeah, Fabrice's question? So the contradiction, you know, I think you raise a extraordinarily important uh, question in terms of where this money is going. Now, I think that there's two parts to it. One is it's going to be difficult to change because as you saw in that graph where non-alumni giving versus alumni giving surpassed in 1986, the vast majority of people are now giving to higher education to institutions that they are uh, connected to. 
right? So to ask people to move away from their organizational identity that they have with their institution and to give to other institutions is a foreign concept right now um, in higher education, uh, individual philanthropy. There's been some interesting questions about um, supporting uh, the most sm small institutions. And I want to also say from an endowment perspective, one thing that I uh, was going to say that I don't think I mentioned is that endowments uh, are tremendous for these large, inst uh, large institutions. You can see 400 and something billion dollars, blah, 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 a lot. But the average endowment in the United States higher education is about $115 million. So you're talking about all of these ridiculous large uh, endowments are really in the top 1% or half a percent of institutions. We have about 4,000 institutions of higher education in the United States, right? So what do you do? So there's been some conversation in, in, uh, about what institutions do we support? And when you look at which institutions are actually having the greatest success in making a systemic change in higher education, you can look at minority serving institutions in the United States, like historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities. Uh, there's now a new designation uh, over the last uh, <laughs> 10 years called Anapesis, Asian American and Native Pacific Islander serving institutions. These institutions are taking students oftentimes who are from the lowest SES, they are uh, lowest socioeconomic levels, and otherwise would not be getting into uh, college and university, and they're going to open access institutions and they're graduating. And there's examples, especially of historically black colleges and universities, in which not only are they graduating, but they're successfully making it into medical schools and things like that. So you're really seeing these transformative issues and they're doing it on a shoestring budget. So when you think about where the individual impact can be, you're absolutely right that it's often at the institutions that, need, that don't have the money and that's where we should be investing. How that's going to uh, take place on the individual level, I don't know. There was a debate um, a few years ago um, about thinking about some sort of sharing of endowments once they reach a larger level and it's a conversation that uh, comes up and never goes anywhere. But it's something that we need to be thinking about. But you know, you can also understand that Harvard's gonna say that this was our earned money, we're not going to share it, even though they have more than enough to share. There's one more question here. I understood nothing because of my poor English, bad hearing, but I got one thing is that your address was fantastic, very interesting, and coming close to some question I have had in mind since my birth, and I was waiting for the person to ask my question. So, Thanks, unfortunate. No pressure, okay. <laughs> in Europe, there is a tradition that wealth is something selfish, uh, non-scientific, and at best can be given to scientific people, scientific uh, uh, public good people to, okay. But even in Europe, education in, is in such a disarray that sometimes new ideas and open debate come from wealth and private sector and private school. I heard worse in this very room six months back the Director General of the UN, United Nations for Europe, said that one day there will be a corporate Secretary General of the UN. He said, fresh ideas come now from the public sector. He may be right, wrong, but this is, these are things which could not be told, not heard 20 years back. So my question is, besides giving money, is there a role for philanthropy in boosting the educational debate. For instance, you address the issue of prestige. This very house, Graduate Institute, tries to be both the most prestigious worldwide and the best worldwide. There might be a trade-off. This Graduate Institute will discover with time, maybe, that there is a trade-off. You cannot pursue both intellectual excellence and world prestige. 
especially not so close from the United Nations. So is there a role for the private sector and philanthropic uh, circles to trigger this debate, these debates, this kind of debates? So that was my question. And you may be rude to the Graduate Institute, I will not report. <laughs> um, so I think since you've been waiting a long part of your life to ask that question, it's, <laughs> it, it, it was, it, it, it's a very heavy question. I, you know, I think that educational quality and prestige have little to do with each other. And I think, you know, that's easy for me to say coming from, as a member of a faculty at an elite institution, and I recognize that privilege that I'm coming from a top-ranked institution, both in education and also the larger institution. So, um, but I don't think that if we were going to look at the impact of teaching and learning on uh, at an institution and the way that we currently rank, we're going to see the same institutions on top. I think that there's much more innovative uh, teaching and learning going on at some smaller institutions that are more teaching focused than at research institutions that tend to be at the top of the list where the philanthropy is going and it's going to, for the answer that I gave for Fabrice as well in terms of looking in, within the US context at minority serving institutions and their impact um, positive impact on our nation. When it comes to where philanthropy's role in this is, I think that there is a role for philanthropy, but I struggle to see where that role is in giving towards an individual institution. I think that that needs to be external pressure, and it needs to be larger conversations that cut across um, institutions, and we've been doing that a little bit in the United States. The National Academy of Education has been bringing institutions together to have some of these conversations, and there's um, uh, money associated with those conversations, but we haven't been doing it on a global scale, and I think that that's where we're, where we're reaching out, and I think that that might be part of the answer to your question is not uh, investing in innovation at individual institutions, but trying to create a global community from the outside pushing higher education in those directions. <laughs> Okay. We can talk after the break. Yes, let's, <laughs> let's do it. I want to take two very quick questions, and I think there's Raymond and there is Kita, but please make it short. Sorry, and is there a Facebook online question? No. And there's a third one there, but really three short questions only. You can start, Raymond. Should I start? Oh, you go ahead. Yeah, okay, uh, so thank you very much. Um, so we tend to sort of measure philanthropy in terms of the amount of money that is floating around, right? But I think another way to sort of look at it is to look at the number of people, right? So one of the things, for instance, that is unique about the United States is not only that, you know, these universities have huge amounts of funding, but also there's a very vibrant uh, volunteer culture, which, you know, our talk will coined back in the 19th century. Um, so I was wondering if there's a way to sort of, if that information is available, for instance, to look at the number of people, the percentage of people who give, you know, not millions of dollars, but, you know, $50, $100 and whatnot. I think that's also important, you know, if we sort of take a step back, you know, with all these crowdsourcing and things that are happening, does it actually apply to the uh, your research as well? Okay. Thank you. Remo, and then I, you take the three questions at a time, if you agree, and then you can wrap up. Thank you. Just a very quick question. One of your ending slides, I think, showed that alumni giving increased. Um, I, I, read, I heard about, uh, I think, a, a policy that the American higher education institutions have where families, or children of families of alumni have a, a, a little bit of a head start when it comes to being accepted to these higher educations. So if, if there is a correlation between giving by alumni and the links that their children get a more favorable end, uh, uh, go at, at being accepted, maybe that could be a good argument to go back to what you suggested, to uh, rediscuss the whole process of higher education and to make it a more collective rather than just earmarked for one of these um, very successful higher institutions who attract so much money that goes into an endowment 
but in fact also it skews a bit the entrance uh, access by minority or less privileged uh, uh, children of less privileged families. The point is clear. Gita, last question for you. Uh, Just wait for the microbe because we're still live streaming. Amy's running. <laughs> I know that you're an expert in higher education, but now that you followed a little bit the debates, it's interesting for us that in higher education, it's almost like families giving or alumni. And in, with no expectation of having impact, any policy impact on higher education policy or on the institution. Why is that? Why in higher education, why is that so different that they give without expectation? expectations of having an impact on, in terms of innovation or other kinds of uh, issues that, that we are discussing in the field of development? Or has that, not, has that been different than previous times, maybe? So I'll start with Gita's question. I think, first of all, I think that individuals do uh, have influence in higher education. We do try to ha um, maintain a distance with donor control in higher education more so than uh, in other aspects of the philanthropic world. I think we're a little bit better about that and I think that that comes from the concepts of shared governance and academic freedom, et cetera, that we have. But if you think about um, the power of the wealthy alumnus or alumna to give an endowed gift, that means that something's going to be in perpetuity. So for instance, the first endowed gift uh, for a professorship in the United States, probably is not surprising to most of you, is, was at Harvard. And it was the creation of the Harvard Divin Divinity Chair. That decision to take that, that chair tied Harvard to the teaching of divinity in perpetuity. Right? There were years in which, there were decades in which they had no one sitting in that uh, chair because the institution was grappling with whether there was a need to continue this study from an academic standpoint, at least at Harvard, right? But they went back and, they, and it's, it's filled again because they had this endowment that they couldn't do anything else with if they didn't do it. So there is a level of influence that's happening by individuals. You can also see it in the reverse stage. So you're, you're seeing now also people withdrawing support when there, and these are the smaller individuals that we're getting to with the small gifts of $50, $100, and things like that, withdrawing their support because they know that their participation accounts for a lot, and sometimes more than their actual dollar that they give, when they see in, instances on campus that they disagree with, and trying to put pressure on administration to make changes that way. So I do think it's happening. It's happening in a different way, though to the question around legacy admits. So the concept of um, giving so that your child or grandchild could uh, get into the institution. There's no doubt that it happens. I don't want to make it sound like it's not happening. It's happening much less than it had been in the past. Um, this concept of, uh, it's also been thought about as a wealthy affirmative action in which uh, people are getting uh, access to an uh, institution that they might not otherwise get into because of the wealth of their parents or the legacy of their family at the institution. And it's, and it's occurring, and we can talk about some people who are associated with the current White House that uh, had that happen on all different levels, Jared Kushner. Um, <laughs> but, but institutions are not giving it as much of a weight as they used to. I still think it's happening informally, but the formal level of assuming that you're going to give and that's going to gain access, I think um, in the mid-1990s you can see a distance in terms of that. But we can talk more about that. And then the other question was about small-time gifts, right? So I think that this is absolutely important. Now, what's interesting, and this is where I focus on, I focus most of my research looking at the smaller gifts because I think that there are plenty of people who are looking at the mega donors, whether uh, as foundations or as individuals. And I think, that, I think that this is actually the most interesting population as to why people are uh, giving, especially because for many of the small-time donors, that $50, $100, gift is a larger percentage of their disposable income than the mega donors are giving, right? So what's interesting, though, is that 
we're having more and more people graduate from higher education in the United States because there's increasing access and we're also getting better at actually uh, graduating the students, which is fantastic. However, that's creating a, a larger denominator when you're trying to figure out alumni giving per percentages. So consistently, we're getting the same number of people who are giving, but over the last 10 years, we're seeing a, lar a, sm a, a decrease, a, lar a smaller percentage of alumni participation across the board. Although more people are giving because the denominator is greater. We're having more graduates. So there's a lot of question as to how that's going, how, how this trend is going to affect uh, institutions' engagement with uh, their smaller donors. Um, and institutions, because of that, are spending a lot more time, which I think is quite interesting, uh, teaching philanthropy and cultures of philanthropy and the importance of philanthropy to the, in, to the institution of, of students. So they're doing a lot of education of students about why when they graduate they should give. So it's not a surprise uh, that when they graduate they're going to get a, um, a solicitation. I, I think that this is laughable in some ways. Um, but I think it does actually impact a larger conversation that we're having here, that it's not just a question of whether you're going to give back to your alma mater, but a larger conversation of what it means to be teaching uh, the responsibility or the philanthropic nature of individuals and how that's going to impact society more largely than just the individual institution. Right. So with that, thank you again. Also, thank you for taking on your time on Thanksgiving. This closes our second day. It's still daylight, so that was a little bit of the objective to say within the daylight when we finish. We'll take it up again tomorrow morning at 9 with a keynote by Maya Ziswiller from UBS Optimus Foundation to give us an insight foundation perspective. And then uh, tomorrow we'll finish up around noon. So thanks again for participating. Have a lovely evening and see you tomorrow. <laughs>